before we get into a new series, we're talking about abortion today. I've had a lot of questions coming out of our Q&A from a few weeks ago, and there's just been a lot of questions, even things that are going on culturally. I'm not even going to do a big introduction. I'm going to jump right into the Bible. We're going to go to Proverbs 31. So we talk a lot about being a Proverbs 31. We hear about Proverbs 31 women. I want to talk about being a Proverbs 31 Christian right now. Um, if you're new around here, man, uh, welcome. You know, I'm hoping that today you... Uh, you get to hear how we process scripture, but we believe in the Bible and we believe in scripture and we're going to go right there. I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 31 starting in verse 8. I'm going to go and hit a couple places in scripture in a minute. I'm going to ask Kathy Grotto to come up here as well, um, the director of Sarah, who's pretty wonderful. And here we go. If you're ready, say amen. If you're watching this down the road, maybe someone invited you to come back and watch this online later. Um, can I just tell you that... Um, if you've got a friend that would do something like that, it's probably because they love you a lot. And uh, we don't think we have all the answers to very complex uh, issues, but we do think that God is very good and that God reveals himself. And so that's where we're going to go today. Proverbs 31.8 says this, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all, and that's going to be a key word, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the poor and needy. Let's pray. Jesus, help. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Let me just kind of talk about opening your mouth, judging righteously, and pleading the cause of the poor and the needy. Open your mouth, he says, for the speechless. This is the writer of Proverbs chapter 31, probably um, to have a conversation between uh, something that a king learned from his mother is what we know is going on. He says, open your mouth for the speechless. And there's something about this, he says, for all of those uh, who are destitute. One version says, for all those who are uh, appointed to die, for those that are being, um, th those that are in trouble. Over in Proverbs chapter 24, in verse 11, it says, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. And if you say, behold, we didn't know this, doesn't he who weighs the heart perceive it? Doesn't he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? Open your mouth, he says, for all who are destitute. Now, the challenge of our day right now is the word all. Because we live in a day that people would describe as uh, it's a tribalistic day, which means, and I need you to follow me on this, it means that where we are right now culturally is that people have separated into tribes. So you've got left-leaning tribes and right-leaning tribes, and you've got causes and different activities and different um, uh, things that people are giving themselves toward. And a lot of times, there, I would say there's a lot of cultural dishonesty going on right now because you'll have someone in a tribe that is speaking to their tribe, and they're defending the cause of their tribe, and they're going hard in their tribe, and then they'll get some hate from people outside of their tribe, and they'll say something like, man, I'm taking hits for this, I'm taking a lot of suffering for this, but in reality, a lot of them are actually getting rich, making a lot of money, getting a lot of followers on social media or whatever, because the, in the day we live in now, you don't get successful by reaching everybody, you get successful by finding your niche or your tribe and going after your tribe or your niche. What that means is that people tend to get, you don't need a million people, you just need a few. You need your followers, you need your people, and you go get your deal. And so what happens is, we tend to pick our causes. But the problem is there's so many different issues that are on the table. For example, voters' rights. Like as many of you guys know, uh, for us as a church, like we do believe in voters' rights. I, I, was, I, I won't lie, I was very disappointed with how things have gone down with Amendment 4 because Amendment 4 got passed, but then um, you've got felons that, have, that are going to be able to get their voters' rights back, but the average felon owes $600, and he's going to have to pay that off before he can go and get his rights back. So functionally speaking, there's a whole bunch of voters that Amendment 4 is going to do nothing for them because it's almost like a poll tax that they're going to have again, which brings back things from the past. And so you got, so many of us, like me, have a heart for voters' rights. There are slaves in the Far East. There's never been more slaves than there are right now. And so for some people, their cause is human trafficking. They're in it to end it, and their, their cause is human trafficking. For some people, their cause is women. And in, in a world of misogyny, in a world where there's been so many women have been put down, for some people, their deal is women. For some people, it's black lives. Black lives matter. For some people, it's going to be uh, unborn. It's going to be the rights of the unborn. And what a lot of people do is what they've said is, in mistaking the reality that God has called every one of us to different callings, meaning I don't need every one of you to be equally devoted to every cause, yet the gospel and what the scriptures tell us about the church and God's people and what, especially for those that are in leadership, but for God's churches, it says you've got to open your mouth for the rights of 
all who are destitute. What that means is I don't get the right as a leader of a church to say, I'm going to cherry pick and say our church is going to be about these causes, but it's not going to be about these causes because if you follow Jesus, you've got to be, you don't get to choose your causes. Jesus already has. And he says, if you have a voice, you have to use your voice for those who have no voice. Let me say it again. If you have a voice, you have to use your voice for those who have no voice. Now, what I'm tempted to do is to only use my voice for the causes that naturally jive with what my personality or my culture or my background is, and yet I feel like a guy that's ready to take a million shots a lot of times because if you represent Jesus and if you go by what Scripture says, you have to use your voice to defend the rights of those who have no voice, and that means all of them, which means if if you're white, I mean, many of you guys hear me say this, you need, to, you need to accept the fact that there is such a thing as white privilege. There is. If you're white, deal with that. Accept that. And live in the light of that where you're recognizing there is such a thing as white privilege. If you're an American, there is such a thing as American privilege. Yes. It's the air you breathe. Yes. If you were born in the United States of America, you'll be unaware of the needs of third world countries. You need to live with that. You need to, you need to understand that to be able to take that in. If you're a man, yes. Men, we live in a world where women are many, many times, for all of human history, women have been pushed to the side, treated like children. It is a world where it's the air you breathe. Misogyny has been like the air that we breathe. And friends, today where I'm going with this is I need you to know, especially if you're a millennial, if you were raised in the United States of America, the air that you breathe is an air of born privilege where you have the privilege of being able to not care about the unborn because you've been told it's nothing but a fetus. When in God's revelation, what he says, there's something much bigger is going on here. And you cannot simply stand by and do nothing about this. People say, well, that's not my cause. You don't get to choose your cause. You can choose what you devote yourself to. You don't get to choose where you lift your voice because if you have a voice, you have to use your voice for those who have no voice. See, see if you follow Jesus, we're, we're not supposed to be defined by our tribes on earth. We're supposed to be defined by the culture of heaven. I don't get, it would be so much easier for me just to just get up and talk happy thoughts, but even right now, culturally, everyone's asking, hey, Mike, what does God say about abortion? And, and guys, I, I, let me just make one more point on this. I'll get, put that, do you have that, that picture from the, from the tweet this week? Jonathan Edwards is one of my theological heroes, one of the smartest men that America has ever put out, great man. What we have right here, though, is this is a bill of sale of a slave that he bought. Here's what I need you to understand. There are very good people that had been completely and utterly wrong about things in human history. Jonathan Edwards was a great theologian, many people's heroes, theologically speaking, and yet he owned slaves, and he was, he was more progressive than many wicked, horrible, whatever kind of people. But when we look back, he'd be like, Jonathan Edwards, what are you thinking? You love Jesus, and you were completely on the wrong side of that issue. And friends, I want you to hear this very carefully. There are some of you that are listening to me now, and I know you love God, and I know you love Jesus. And I know you want to do the right thing. And I know you love the Bible. And I know you love people. And you are still on the wrong side of the abortion issue. Because when you're looking, you think it's about abortion and God says it's about life. You're thinking it's about laws and God says it's about the dignity of humans. And we've got to base the dignity of where we say humans hold dignity, not on what my culture says. It cannot be what the law says, because if the law says a black man is three-fifths of a person, the law is wrong. And if the law says that a fetus is not a human being, it's a blob of cells that has no rights, the law is wrong. Am I being clear about this? If you have a voice, you must use your voice for those who have no voice, for all, for all, for all. Listen, man, I get hits. We did the q and I got, I got people mad at me on the left, and I got people mad at me on the right. So if we follow Jesus, one of the reasons you've got to love heaven is because if you follow Jesus, all the tribes on earth are always going to be ticked off at you. That's why we're like, oh, thank God heaven's coming. <laughs> Open your mouth. Then he says judge righteously. Yes, he says judge. Judge righteously. The question on the floor is this. I'm going to give you the scripture, but I'm going to give you the philosophy first. Here's the question on the floor. What is the basis of human rights? What is the basis of human rights? I don't want to be mean, and I want to be gentle, and I want to be kind, but guys, let me be clear. What is the basis of human rights? What a guy like Peter Singer from Princeton University would say 
is that Roe versus Wade got it right because unborn babies, fetuses, they don't have capacities. And because they don't have capacities, they cannot have rights. So the logic goes, can a fetus think for itself? No. Can a, can a fetus make moral judgments? No. Can a fetus um, make you know, good choices? No, it cannot. It's not viable. It's got no capacities. And so therefore, it doesn't have the same rights that a human that has capacities has. The problem with this, of course, is that there are senile old people that don't have capacities. Do they have human rights? The problem is there are one-day-old babies and 60, I mean, I've had, I haven't had a million, but I've had eight children, and I can tell you that they don't have capacities for a long time. In fact, I even wonder if some of them that are teenagers have capacities. <laughs> and what, I, what I'm trying to say is this, you are going to find, you're gonna root human rights somewhere. And what our culture, listen, what our culture is doing right now is rooting human rights in either capacities or if the child is wanted or if the child has a likelihood of, of survival. I was reading, like I read the Utney Reader, which is, you know, not a Christian, organ, Christian magazine at all. I was reading Utney Reader. 11% of those polled said they would abort their fetus if they knew that their child would be predisposed toward being obese. Now, that's not a million. That's, that, you could still say 9 out of 10 wouldn't. 11% of people polled said, if there was a test that could tell you for sure my kid might be really fat, I would go ahead and terminate that pregnancy. There's, there's, you can either look at capacities, or I can tell you where Scripture says. Scripture says we root human dignity and value in the image of God. Your worth is not based on what you can produce, and it is not based on what capacities you have. Your worth and your dignity and your right to exist is there because of whose image you were made in. And I want to tell some of you some of this right now. There are, there are some of you in here, you are the product of a rape, and I need you to know this. Your dignity is not based on who your father on earth was. Your dignity is who your father in heaven is, and his name is God. Your mom might have said, I didn't want you. Your dad might have said he didn't want you. All I got to tell you is this. God wants you. God wants you. God made you. God created you. God loves you. You have worth not because of how you were conceived. You've got worth because of the one that breathed into you life. That's why you've got worth. See, this is why scripture says, open your mouth. But then he says, judge righteously. The early church. And Kathy, get ready because I'm going to need you up here in a second. But judge righteously. The early church lived in the Greco-Roman world. I need you to know, man, in the Greco-Roman world, abortion was rampant. Infanticide was rampant. Aristotle would say that certain races were superior to other races, which is why, of course, there should be slavery. It was just obvious that certain races were less reasonable than others. All the philosophers, many of the philosophers of the day would say that women were clearly unreasonable and highly emotional. Therefore, they, were, they had much less capacities than men had. The early church was in that culture, and the early church into that culture lifted their voice, and the earliest Christians would say, abortion is wrong. Infanticide is wrong. Mistreating women is wrong. They would, the early church goes into a world and goes totally counter-cultural and says, it doesn't matter what Aristotle says. It doesn't matter what the Roman laws say. What it matters is what God has said. And God says every human has dignity because it was made in the image of God. Put these scriptures up there. Psalm 139 verse 13. Psalm 139. It says, for you for my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful all your, are your works. My soul knows it very well. Oh, oh, friends, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Can I just tell you, man, when you were in your mother's womb, God was knitting you together. Give me the next one. Give me that next slide. Psalm 22, verse 10. It says, on you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb, from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Okay, this is what scripture says. Give me the next one, Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was in the belly, and he was already getting worked by God. Some of you that are pregnant right now, God only knows what Jesus is doing in that womb of yours. And then finally, give me that Genesis 1, 27. This is, where the, this is where it all comes from. Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. That is why every 
human life deserves to live. The issue is not laws. The issue is the right to live. People say, Mike, are you against abortion? No, I'm against murder. I'm, I'm in favor of life. That is the issue that is on the floor. People say, well, it's just so unclear. Put the Exodus verse up there. Go ahead and put that up there. Exodus 21, 20 through, 20 through 24. And people say, well, Mike, is the Bible clear on this? Yeah, check this out. When men strive together and they hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. This was, this was God's revelation of what happens when an unborn, what we would call fetus, when an unborn, when, it, when a fetus, if the eye is injured, then it was an eye, even this scripture, eye for eye, was about rights of unborn humans. Now guys, I'm, obviously, there's 10,000 things that are way easier to talk about than this, but when scripture says, open your mouth for the mute, for all, all who are destitute, open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights, I'm calling you today, if you have a voice, you need to use your voice for those who have no voice. Kathy, would you join me up here, because I want to talk about how we can, we can actually practically, what we can practically do about this. And I'm thrilled today to not just be able to talk about it, but this is Kathy Grotto. Could you guys make her feel very welcome? <laughs> Kathy is, she is an absolute all-star. She is the director of CIRA, um, formerly Women's Resource Center. Um, Kathy, tell us, uh, a, tell us about, about what, what you guys do at CIRA. Tell me what you guys do and, and what, what are you guys about? What do you okay. guys do? What's the vision? That kind of thing. And then I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay. We don't turn on microphones usually, obviously. Um, so our um, vision, I guess, is founded on the scripture verses that you shared, and also... Did you agree with what I've said so far? Did I what? Did you agree with what I've said so far? Mostly. Okay. No, yeah, I agree. I'm just kidding. Just totally kidding. <laughs> of course. I told you to say it. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway... <laughs> In Acts 17, this verse always strikes me, and I think now in, in talking about this issue, it's very striking, because in Acts 17, it says that we are all created, not, not only in the image of God, which obviously is huge, but we're created at a specific time, and our life is in a specific place. And when you think about that, the people you interact with, the neighborhood you're a part of, the church you're a part of, the people you pass on the street, um, that's all on purpose. Like God has a purpose for all of that, and that's huge. And that, that goes for every unborn child. They, they have unique DNA, and they have unique purpose, because in Ephesians it says we, we were created for specific plans and purposes by our God. And when that's gone, it's gone. And so that's, that's another thing that this rests on. And that's, so what do you guys do at Sarah? Like what, what do you do to kind of respond to this? Well, we have a vision that men and women will embrace life, walk in freedom, and positively affect their community. And so embrace life is that they recognize that, that they recognize their life is critically important and so is their unborn child. We know people have made mistakes um, we know that they need to feel forgiveness. We know people have had abortions, participated, paid for, transported. And we want them to know that there is forgiveness in that. And not only is there forgiveness, but there's freedom that they can walk in that. And positively impact their community. We want them to know to take what they've learned and share with others. We're called to do that anyway, but in this specific case, it's really important. You guys are obviously responding to things. Tell, tell me about some of the effects, because you see it firsthand. What are some of the effects of abortion You know, on, on a woman, on a man, on a family? Tell us about that. Okay, we have women that actually are on staff. We have volunteers. We have men volunteers that have experienced abortion. Some of them are in their 60s, and they still can't talk about it without tearing up. It affects you for the rest of your life, because at some point you're going to recognize what you have done. Um, and a lot of times what the women will say is, well, I didn't know what to do. I was in desperate straits, or my boyfriend was pressuring me, or my husband was pressuring me. I didn't have anybody to talk to. 
um, and my parents were going to disown me. So we. Wait, you know, one of the interesting things to me is a lot of the, uh, a lot of the rhetoric I hear culturally is, um, don't try to force a woman to do something. You know, a woman should be able to choose for herself. Yet a, a lot of the girls in our church are college students that have been in our church. The irony is when they've talked to me, they said it was boyfriends and families and friends pressuring them to go get exactly. abortions. Exactly. It was very interesting, you know, because I was like, wow, it's you know, the, the women weren't being empowered many times. No, no, absolutely not. And then uh, um, beyond that, parenting is affected, um, raising children, the guilt doesn't go away necessarily, and you're reminded of it on the anniversary of their, their birth. You feel inadequate. We had one woman that um, said she, she never felt adequate as a mom, but she also always felt like she should be in prison because she had committed murder. And she was, she was walking around alive, but her two children weren't. Those are some of the things that they wrestle with. You know, we hear a lot about, um, you know, one of the things we, we actually have talked about even here in our church, the disproportionate nature of the justice system that, that happens. Like, for example, the African-American community gets uh, disproportionately represented um, in jail or when, when you're watching how law comes out. Interestingly, because when, when I was reading the statistics this week when you and I were talking, it was very interesting that it almost mirrors exactly the same way that um, my, people of color will often not get the same justice everybody gets. People of color are disproportionately represented in a, the number of babies being killed. Talk absolutely, to me about that. Absolutely, absolutely. Black women represent 13% of the population, and black babies are 37% of the population. Abortion takes more, it's the leading cause of death in the African American community is abortion. Since 1973, all diseases, crimes, anything that took the death or caused death for an African American still doesn't add up to the number of abortions since 1973. Tell me what you were telling me about the, like even the population size of the different minority uh -huh. communities in the United States right now and what that's looking like going into like the 2030s. When 1,900 um, abortions a day for black women, 427 out of 1,000. So you can see the downward trend of what's happening to the population. By the year, if this continues, by the year 2038, the African American vote will be negligible. So that's pretty huge. Um, in our own community, there was a plan for all of this. I, I can I put in a plug for you Myafa? Can. You I, can. I already did actually. Myafa 21 is a DVD. It's a YouTube. You can actually watch it. It talks about the eugenics plan that was in 1900s, and you will see that what they planned back in the early 1900s is exactly coming to fruition now. Hopefully it'll get you riled up a little bit. The abortion statistics in our own community, when you think about Gainesville, Florida, this is happening. 2016, there were 1,604 recorded abortions. 2017, 1,575. 2018, 1,865. The number's going up. We thought it was going down. It's going up. In the first quarter of 2019, there were already 625, which if that trend continues, it will be 2,500 by the end of the year. 97% of the abortions in 2019 were for the convenience of a mother. 63 million babies have been lost since 1973 in the United States. That's huge. Kathy, tell me a story of hope, like something that you guys have seen happen, something that you guys have done at Sierra, maybe a, a woman that you've worked with, you know, that just kind of gives us some hope about what can happen. Okay. Can I tell you a bad story first? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. It, it's hard to work there. There's some days it's very, very painful. Like you get up in the morning and you think, I don't know if I can do this because we pour into these women. We want them to know truth. And there are a lot of days where they walk away, and we, we call it that they turn left when they leave our parking lot, because when they turn left and make a, an immediate right, they're going to the abortion clinic. And we see them do that. Like, we will stand, and we'll pray at the window, and we will see them turn left and then right, and it's hard. It's hard to do that. Um, but not all stories are like that. 
Um, we By the have, way, if a woman does do that, how, how do you, tr like, what's your posture toward her? Our posture, we always tell them we have abortion minded, abortion vulnerable women. When we know they have not made up their mind of what they're going to do, we tell them no matter what you do, you, we're here. We're here for you. You can come talk to us. We will counsel you. We'll pray with you. We will help you in any way we can. There is no judgment at our center whatsoever. Do you, have you ever had follow-up with people that had an abortion and they came back to you? Absolutely. We had a young woman fairly recently that she wasn't even a believer and all of our studies and things are, are faith-based. She came back, she'd had an abortion, she didn't know what to do. She started this program. She became a believer in the middle of the program and she found freedom and faith in Jesus through that program. It was so awesome. That was beautiful. Amen. Yeah. So I want to hear a good story. Okay, here's the good story. So this lady came in. She was a college student. She was a senior. And I can share her story. We, we are very confidential, just so you know that. But she gave permission for this story. She was a senior um, in college. She came. She, she kept taking pregnancy tests. They were always positive. And so she came in, and she was just wrestling with it. And she was not in a good mood, needless to say. And she was very closed but she came, she wanted to see what would happen. We have medical grade pregnancy tests. So she came, the test was positive, she was kind of closed, we talked to her, prayed for her, she came back for her ultrasound, um, and still pretty stressed out, the guy was not with her. She was dating a guy, they were kind of on the outs, he was in Miami, she was here. Um, it, she was gonna graduate in May, she did not have time for babies. Her life was starting, and she was considering an abortion. That was just kind of the easy way out at this point. She got into the ultrasound room, and not only was there one baby, there were two babies. And that woman did a 180. She called her boyfriend. They got married over spring break. They have two of the cutest little Hispanic babies you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> they are so cute. And that was, she said, you know what God did? He took my mess and he gave me a message. And that's why we do what we do every day, because that's what we hope for the women that come in there. When those girls come in, do you charge them for the sonogram? Ab absolutely. You no, do? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa. I thought I knew the answer on that one. Um, do you get and a if there's two, we do you double get a commission on every commission, sonogram you do? Absolutely. So, so here's a question. Do you, do you personally have like a lot of vested interest? Like are you getting rich on every sonogram that happens? Uh, or no. are you getting a kickback from some no. you know, Illuminati you know, no. anti-abortion no. commission that's doing our something? Our tribe is not rich. <laughs> <laughs> no, all of our services are completely free. And that is just generosity of our community. How important is it that you create a safe place, like a no judgment zone, a, a place where, where you're going to tell someone what, I mean, the reality is, I mean, I, I think there is science that, that can make someone pro-life, but I mean, I think the reality, and, and church, I need you to know this, I am pro-life like I am because of what God's word has said. Like, we have to choose, like, do we go on what the Bible says, or am I going on the rhetoric of whatever politicians influence me? Like, that really is what it comes down to. Like, when I come to Jesus, I have my persuasions and preferences in, in my culture, but will I bow everything to him and what he, what he has revealed, you know? Um, but when that happens, so my point is we, we do feel strongly about this, and I feel very strongly about this, but the reality is so people are going to disagree with you. you know? how, how important is it that you create a safe place? Because God doesn't use shame. You know, mm -hmm. God doesn't use guilt trips. God doesn't... I mean, can you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I think we, re we remember and remind ourselves is people who have abortion are not evil people. They, they don't start out getting up in the morning and say, I'm going to do the most atrocious thing I possibly can today because I feel evil today. That's not it. Like, they, they're pressured. It's a very difficult decision. So we start out with that. They're not evil people. Our place is a no judgment zone. If I told you stories, your hair would stand up on your head of some of the stories we hear of the women and the men that come in there. We begin every session asking the woman her story. You cannot counsel 
anybody with any kind of credibility unless you know their story. And so we talk to them and we ask them and we find out women had to hide in a closet while they were growing up or, or women were sexually abused by their father growing up. Horrible stories. But, but we start with that knowing the pain that then the circumstances they're dealing with. And we ask questions and we listen and we strive to understand. All our, conf all our conversations are um, confidential. And one of the things that's interesting, Mike, that's kind of going along with what you asked, the women that volunteer and work there, this is the kind of the illustration that I think of, is they have this box, like a box of tools. And it's, it's full of everything. It's full of Bible verses, it's truth, it's logic, it's, it's you know, counter -arg arguments, it's everything in that box. And then as they start listening to stories and work there, the rough edges of the box start to smooth a little bit. And, and what they started out with their passion for truth and for life and for the unborn, justice for the unborn, has become compassion. It's compassion in addition to that passion, and that's what makes the difference. Kathy, how should I respond to a roommate? A lot of college students that are gonna watch this. How should I respond to a roommate that just had an abortion? Okay, um, I think Remind yourself that abortion is a big decision, but it, there were a lot of little decisions that, added, that led up to that. So start with that. Remind yourself and remind them that we are all sinners saved by grace. Our, our righteousness is not because of what we've done. It's not because of what we haven't done, but it's because we have a Savior that died on the cross and took all of our sin. Amen with him and and he took the punishment and he's the one that forgives is abortion the unpardonable sin no and that's the other thing you know the answer to that, right <laughs> i'm testing to see i'm testing now, you right i know now, the right? answer to that yes that's the that's but that's a great reminder that there is there's nothing that's not covered under the blood there's no exception to that and there's nothing we have to add to get more grace he did it all. He did it all. It's complete. All right, let me say this a little more directly. There are some of us in this room. In fact, there's a lot of us in this room. And, and there's a lot, of, a lot of us that are watching that we have participated in abortion. There, there are women that have. There are husbands that insisted. There are boyfriends that demanded. There are parents that pressured. And maybe even now, we haven't wanted to think about it, you know, but what would, what would you say to us? Um, I would say that um, you may need to forgive. Like, you may need to forgive the person that pressured you because if you carry unforgiveness, think of all the verses in the Bible about forgiveness and how critical and important that is. It's like carrying a ball and chain around your neck or around your ankle. That's not your neck. It's your ankle, right? Okay, so that's what it's like. Like, you carry that unforgiveness, so get rid of it. You can't change it, but you can change the forgiveness part. And there might be people you need to tell. There might be people that you need to tell about what you've done. That might be what you're carrying. But as with everything, when it is exposed to the light, then, then Satan has no power and control over. It's out there. So you will release yourself. That's good. Kathy, have you seen people that were struggling with guilt or shame and then walk through? I know you guys do counseling even with men and women, mm -hmm. even post-abortion. Mm -hmm. Have you seen people experience freedom and peace? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and it not only helps them, but it gives them a voice. Mm. Because if one in four women under the age of 45 have had an abortion, there's a lot of women in this, the church walls are not a barrier to it. It gives them a voice and an ear and a heart to share with others and have others share with them. By the way, I love the questions that she just asked. You know, who, who do you need to forgive and who do you need to tell? I mean, even today, there might be somebody that might even have nothing to do with abortion, but even just that word, like, who, is there someone that you need to forgive? 
And sometimes when we can't get past something, there's someone we need to go tell. And it needs to be safe. It needs to be a safe place. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are just biblical principles of right. confessing things to one another and praying for each other that you can get healed. I think it's a beautiful thing. Sometimes we don't experience healing until someone prays for us, but they don't pray for us in first until we first confess to them. And it's beautiful. You know, we yeah. confess to God for forgiveness, but sometimes we confess to other people for healing, yes. which is beautiful. Yeah. Um, just real quick, tell what are some of the things you guys, just to be, so we're, everyone here knows, what does Sira offer? So someone knows, it's over on 13th Street, it, but if someone, if you or if someone you know, and, and I need you to, guys, I've been in there. It is so full of peace, mm -hmm. and it is such a safe place, man. I mean, if, if you walk into an abortion clinic, I mean, just so you're clear, doctors make money on abortions. They, this isn't, it's not like they're just getting the same salary no matter what happens. Like, a doctor has a, an abortion clinic has a vested interest in an abortion clinic because they do make money. It's a, pro, a for-profit deal. Absolutely. You guys are a not-for-profit. I want to get real, I want you guys to understand something too. This, is, this isn't just Kathy Grotto. This is Dr. Kathy Grotto. And she didn't get her, she didn't get her doctor, you know, she didn't get her, she's not a doctor uh -huh. because she went to, you know, Bubba Joe University. Um, I hear you went to a pretty good year. Where'd you, did. Where did you go to school? It's called the University of Florida. Ever okay, so <laughs> orange and blue. So she, uh, she's pretty legitimate, and, and Sarah is not being led by, by someone that's just mildly educated or mildly informed. Um, but the spirit of what happens at Sarah, it really is no judgment, full grace, full truth, safe place, unconditionally loving the girl, but t the girls and the guys that are coming. Uh, but tell us what you offer so if someone just even need a place to go. Yeah, all our services are free. Just as Mike said, we do not um, make any money and we don't charge anything for any of our services, any of our classes, any of our programs. We have pregnancy testing, STI testing, which is sexual, uh, sexual, sexual transmitted infections. We have ultrasounds. We have um, FIT classes, those are family integrity training classes. Um, Nicole Dyson, I know, does those in the, in the prison, and those are wonderful. It's like parenting, budgeting, decision making, anger management, they're all free. They're all, all of them are biblically based. Sexual risk avoidance is something we can bring to youth groups. Um, that's the old abstinence program. Um, we have the post-abortion counseling and education, and then we have sexual healing and restoration education. Th what we've discovered is often just as many decisions lead up to an abortion, there are events in people's <laughs> lives, and it can be something that happened to them or a choice they made. And we have these, the post-abortion and the sexual healing and restoration are for men and women. We have both of those classes. And then we have a women's wellness program, which we don't get a lot of traffic for, but it's really, it's a completely free physical for a woman. She just has to meet some of the criteria, but it's, a, it's an excellent program. It's with a clinic in town, a wonderful clinic in town. So Kathy, we, we would like to support you, and I, and I need you guys to know, as a church, we already do support Sarah. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, I, I want you to feel very supported today. In fact, even before we're done, we're gonna, we'll have buckets in the back. If anyone wants to give towards Sarah, every dollar that comes in those buckets will go towards Sarah. Uh, can you guys use support? Um, would that Absolutely. Be would that be helpful to do all this free stuff that you're yes. giving away? Would you guys yes. do some of that? Yes. Um, could people volunteer? If people want to get Absolutely. involved, do you need volunteers? Absolutely. And yeah. we, we need women and men. We have men that come in there and make comments like, I'm going to be a dad. I'm so excited I'm going to be a dad, but I never had a dad. I don't know how to be a dad. Yeah. What do we do with that? You know, we're a bunch of women, but we do have men volunteers. We need more men volunteers to step into that. We also have men that say, my mom was a single mom. She did fine. I don't need to be a dad. Yeah. We need men to step into that. Um, also, as far as getting involved, you could pray for us. We need that. It's hard. That's something that we, we need to pray for, not only our hearts and our wisdom, but opportunity to speak to people. Financially giving our services, as Mike said, and we also are trying to put an addition on the back so we have a, an additional classroom space. Um, pray over the abortion clinics. Mike was sharing a story of his daughter did that. That is powerful. If you saw the movie Unplanned, you'll recognize. Prayer, it's a spiritual war, and prayer is the answer for that. If you can just, 
even if they're not doing abortions, just go and pray over those clinics. And pray for your own opportunity yeah. to be a detour to abortions. Pray, pray that you will have the opportunity to speak. That's good. Can we thank God for Kathy Grotto? <laughs> Kathy, God bless you. I know you've got to be somewhere else. We're going we're gonna to have some... We're going to have some people out in the lobby. Andrea and Audrey, her daughter, are going to be out there in the lobby. They'll also have uh, a booth here next week. So for any of you guys that are interested in that, they're going to have a booth. Um, let me just close it by being very crystal clear with all of us here as far as what we can do uh, and where we can go with this. Uh, number one, I know there are some of you that are watching right now. And I know that there are people that are pregnant in a pregnancy that you did not plan, and that you are scared to death. And I know that, that for you, the abortion question, it has not been a philosophical thing. It ha it's, it's not a religious thing, a theological thing. You might even be a believer. And I know you're probably just scared. And it's going to take all the courage in the world to do the right thing here. But I just want to plead with you, keep your baby. If you need help, I want you to go to Sarah. I want you to come to us. I want you to reach out. If you're in a microchurch, I want you to talk to a microchurch leader. If you're in a campus group, I want you to go to your campus group leader. Keep your child. Maybe you've been looking for a sign. Keep that baby. I don't know how God is going to do what God will do but I promise you, there's even people in this body that want to step up and to help you. We've literally had people in our church that there were women in prisons that were gonna abort their babies, went into the prisons and said, keep your child and I'll adopt the child myself. This is what the early church did, okay? Number one, if, if that's you, keep, number two, if you know someone that's about to go do something and you're like, it's, it's not my place to say anything. Friends, if you have a voice, you have to use your voice for those who have no voice. I need you to get past that. I need you to get past that. Right now we're in a world where slavery exists all over. You know what? You could say it's not my place to tell people in the Far East what they should do with their money. No, it is. We have to use our voice for those who have no voice and say slavery, I don't care if it is what your culture does, slavery is wrong. Call it what it is, okay? Do it with gentleness because a gentle answer turns away wrath, but say it, say it. When Sandra Bland died, there was the, the whole thing. Say her name. We gotta call this what it is, man. It's a human made in the image of God, okay? Number three, if, if you are willing and God does move on your heart, I would love for more volunteers to come from Greenhouse, or if you're watching this, even maybe from another church, and go help at Sarah. That is one of the places that they've created a safe place where they are lifting their voice in very safe ways, in godly ways, in precious ways, in free ways, with no pressure zones, seriously and truly, where girls and guys and men and women, they, they have a chance. And I really do want you to pray over these things. Um, last thing I'm gonna say is this. Church, if you lean to the right, I need you taking up the cause of things on the left. Because when people hear you pushing this cause, but you never push all the other causes, your silence on all the other issues is deafening. Someone was asking, Mike, what do you think about the abortion laws going on around the country right now? You know what? I'm, I like abortion laws that are about to put on, to say something's legal, like what God would say. I like that, but I've got concerns if Alabama or, or Missouri or someone would have a law, if they've got laws protecting the unborn, but they don't follow it up with holistic laws that are protecting the born, that's going to be an inconsistency that, that's just going to drive a wedge between all the tribes. So, so if you're, if you, if you lean right th philosophically and politically, I need you taking up all those other causes and so, because otherwise we, it's hard to listen to you on this one. And we need people listening to us on this one. But by the way, I got to say the same thing on the left. If you lean to the left, it's really hard for people to listen to you talk about your causes on the left if you never talk about this one. If you never talk about the rights of the unborn. I mean, someone said, Mike, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? I'm like, Black Lives Matter. The problem is this. If all you're doing is pushing for the rights of born black lives, but you don't ever push for the rights of unborn black lives, your inconsistency drives the wedge between the tribes, and it's a problem, guys. 
man. I mean, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I'm going to end it like this. Mother Teresa was at a prayer breakfast back in the 90s. Bill Clinton was the president. Bill Clinton and Hillary were there. And it was a prayer breakfast and everyone was supporting. We all love Mother Teresa. We love what Mother Teresa does. And Mother Teresa gets up and she's doing her little speech. And she gets to the end. She says, you know, about this abortion thing. And she looked at the president, the president of the United States, the leader of the free world. And, and she says, man, you, you got to stop this abortion thing, man. If you don't want your babies, that's what she said, give them to me. Those are babies made in the image of God. America, if you don't want your babies, come give them to me. We'll take them in. And it was like this awkward moment, you know, politically, because it's kind of like, hey, please don't say anything that's going to offend. The problem is, if you follow Jesus, if you have a voice, you have to use your voice for those who have no voice. Period. It's not easy, and you're going to take shots, and you're going to take hits, and people are going to say, why are you preaching politics? Man, guys, this is, the, this is the Bible. I'm begging you to see that. This is the Bible. How? Because at the end of the day, Jesus is the ultimate rescue hero, that he goes up on a cross where you and me, who were guilty as sin for all of our sins, and the wages of sin is death, we were being drawn to the slaughter. We were being taken to be killed. We were coming to death because the wages of sin is death. And what did Jesus do? He came and he that had a voice used his voice for us who had no voice. I'm as guilty as sin. Before God, I would stand and God would say, what do you have to say for yourself? And my answer would be, there's nothing I can say. I'm guilty of murder and adultery and, and you fill in the blank and anger and, and you, I, I've broken every commandment in the book and so have you. And yet what did Jesus do? He goes up on a cross where he that had a voice, he lifted his voice for us who have no voice. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And us who are being led to the slaughter, Jesus came down. Eye for an eye, he took it. Tooth for tooth, he took it. Life for life, he took it. He stood in the way and took what we deserve so we could get what he deserved. He saved us. He saved us and he loves you and he adores you. And if you're here today and you are not right with God, I would call you today to come to him and let him forgive you. If you're here today and you've just been in, in a state of sin, this is your day to come out. He will forgive you. He gives you no shame. He gives you a no shame zone. He gives you grace because of his blood. He loves you. God loved you so much. He has given everything. So what I'm going to do is ask our prayer team just to join me up across the front because maybe you need a healing today. Maybe you just need to know where a next step to go would be. You can walk. You're welcome to come and pray with one of these. You might need to sit on this for a week and come back next week when Sarah's booth is out there. Or maybe go visit Sarah this week. Maybe you need to have a quiet moment of, of just processing some of this with Jesus. But maybe you're today appointed by God to receive your life by accepting the greatest gift anyone can have, which is salvation. That here you are living a life up until this point away from God and today you can come back to God because he loves you that much. If you need to do that when everyone else is dismissed, come up and receive prayer. Some people are going to come up and they just need prayer because there's pain in their bodies. Some people are going to come receive prayer because there's pain in their soul. Some people need to come receive prayer because you're about to get forgiven and receive the gift of eternal life and you'll be changed forever. Father, I pray your peace on your people and I ask now for the courage to act and respond in Jesus' name. Amen.